great to be here this morning to talk with you about excelling at teaching. Or to put it more colloquially, whoops, are these my slides? Great, thank you. To put it more colloquially, be all you can be, teach. <laughs> If you're like most teachers, your career began thinking, my gosh, you mean they'll pay me to do this? It may have progressed to they don't pay me enough to do this. <laughs> or even in the worst case, it's a hard way to earn your stripes. <laughs> we teach what we most want to know, so I come by the teaching of teaching honest. I've had a lot of hard knocks myself. You could say I went to the school of hard knocks, but it's not the only school or even the best. Much is known about how to be a better teacher and anybody can, and that's what we'll be talking about today. I said I had some hard knocks myself. I'd like to share three of them with you. These are my three least favorite quotes from student evaluations. <laughs> and my personal favorite, this teacher should be fired. <laughs> I knew just what to do. <laughs> I cried. But when I was done crying, I marched myself up to my office and I said, I have to think more seriously even yet again about teaching. And ultimately, I, I said teaching shouldn't hurt this bad. As I mentioned, the School of Hard Knocks isn't the only school, and I tried to become more conscious of what is known from other teachers by reading, by attending workshops like this, by talking to colleagues, by going to classes of colleagues. I wrote down my steps for what made me as successful as I was, meaning for the place and time I was in. What was I doing right? I wrote down those steps. And my steps serve me well. And I'm going to share my steps with you today in hopes that you'll write your own steps for what's working in your class and what you need to do more of, and by omission, what you need to do less of. Naturally, it's a 12-step <laughs> program. <laughs> because teaching is difficult and teaching well is a lifetime project. I remember I got perfect evaluations one semester. Every student marked me as a highest ranking, and I thought I had arrived, only to discover the next term that I had many challenges with the same, because I made fewest changes I had ever made in my teaching between that term and the next. And I had more challenges than you can name the next semester. So it's a lifetime process. We get older, we get better. We go forward, we go back. To me, the classroom has three elephants in the room. Your content, your students, and you. Those are the three big elements. And I want to ask you to turn to a neighbor and buzz, and I'll explain what a buzz is in a moment, about the following question. A buzz is where you have exactly 60 seconds to talk, so you need a timer, and you talk the whole 60 seconds. And then the person that you're with, you can only have two. If you're at a table where you must have three, that's very tight. You might try to find someone at the next table because we're going to do three buzzes. Uh, you might want to find someone at the next table so you can not be in a group of three. Then the other person has 60 seconds to talk, and then we come back to the group. So the question is, what are some challenges that you face with your content, your students, or the way you yourself get in the way of good teaching? So take two minutes, find a partner, and I'll start timing once you look like you've found partners. Right. Let's come back together. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. 
All right, we'll come back together. So if you think of your challenges as you listen to what I'm going to say, I think you'll have a better experience because you'll hear what it is that you're listening for if you listen with a purpose. So that was my idea for that exercise. We'll start with your content, and we'll start with step one. Answer the three questions of course design. I won't fault you if you say there are really four. Um, there are a number of good questions of course design. What, from the audience, what would one good question of course design be? What's the learning objective? What's the learning objective? Thank you. What else? Not all at once. Evaluation. evaluation. How will we evaluate? Audience, I heard too. We need four now. They're all three are right. Yes. How can I incorporate That's an important question. I don't know if it's uh, one of the three questions of course design that uh, Fink gives. And um, how about one more? Schedule. schedule, that's very important. That would go under audience and schedule I would put together, like the conditions of the class. I would put the room size, the number, their preparation. I put all that audience stuff together. One more, activities, thank you very much. That, those are the three questions. So what order would you pose them in? What questions should you ask first when you plan a class? And let me tell you, this is counterintuitive for some of you, if you're old style teachers. Yes. What are, your goals? what are your goals? What are your learning objectives? Thank you. What's second? Activities. Activities. What are you going to do in class tomorrow? That's, that's intuitive, but it's not right. <laughs> How am I going to evaluate? How will I know that they achieve my goals is right? Thank you. And finally, what am I going to do in class tomorrow? Now, I can tell you that for 10 years, I did these backwards. I did, what am I going to do in class today? Um, how am I going to evaluate it? It's midterm. And finally, um, oh my goodness, the accreditors are coming. What are learning objectives? So I did it backwards. I think a lot of us do it backwards, but we should be asking what's the target so we're not like shooting without a target. What's the target? How will we know we achieve the target? And finally, what are we going to do to help the students achieve that target? So those are the three questions of course design. Two years from now, it's called backwards design by Grant Wiggins, and it's called backward design because you first want to think about two years from now, what would you want students to be able to do because they took my class? Secondly, at the end of the course, how will you know they can do it? And thirdly, during the course, how can you help them learn how to do it? Together, it looks like this. And those of you who said audience, that's situational factors. That even precedes these three questions. Things like audience, class size, preparation, et cetera, precedes the three questions of course design. So you ask them first, and then you ask about objectives, assessment, and pedagogy. The tough question is number one, what do you want students to learn how to do? After a workshop like this one, a colleague of mine went back to her psychology uh, peers and sent an email to all the people in the psychology department said, what do we want students to be able to do as opposed to learn and remember? They all answered her. That's the good news. The bad news is they all answered in terms of what they wanted them to learn and remember. Even though she had specifically asked, what do we want them to be able to do? We avoid understand and remember because lecturing leads to understand and remember. So we avoid both. And we avoid them because one year after a, a student, so they took a, they took a time, and then they followed them for seven years. And at time one, they'd had, both had had no lecture. And at time two, one group had had no lecture, and they knew this much. The second group had, no, had had two semesters of economics, and it's been done in psychology, too, with the same basic results they learn 20% more. That's pretty depressing. It gets worse after seven years. No lecture knows that much. 
and lecture knows 10% more. So that's where lecturing got a bad name. So in, instead of lecturing, we try to teach to a learning objective that tells you what students should be able to do at the end of the course, at the end of the class period, actually. And if you think in terms of what students should be able to do, it will help you think of activities to, to know whether they can do it a little bit. For example, at the end of the class today, students will be able to compare and contrast, design, or evaluate. Let's choose evaluate. Suppose you want them to evaluate the quality of an argument. It could be a lab exercise, a lab report. It could be an RFP that you want them to be able to write an RFP meaningfully and say social work. Uh, it could be any kind of an argument, an essay, exam, it could be anything. I recommend one way to achieve this goal, for example, would be to give three examples, an A, a B, and a C, with criteria, a rubric that shows what an A, a B, and a C look like. Have students rank the examples and explain their reasoning. This is a wonderful first step to being able to write the kind of papers you want to write. Because when I do this with undergraduates, my weaker students rank them backwards. I am not kidding. They think the C is the A. If you can't recognize an A from a C, how can you possibly replicate an A? So we start by having them rank. And finally, you compare the rankings to each other and to you. And that brings the students on board. Usually the groups get it right because somebody in the group is adamant that the A is really the A. It's a good step to having people create their own arguments of whatever type you want them to create. A daily learning objective gives students time to practice doing something, and it helps reduce lecturing. Which brings us to step three, limit lectures to 15 minutes. Now when I say that, I mean at a time. You can do a little activity, a short like the buzz we did, and then you get another 15 minutes if you want to do it that way. Your heart's re reaction to lectures is a little depressing. If you look at this graph, uh, this is after 80 minutes. We were afraid, the experimenters were afraid to do it after more than 80 minutes. <laughs> Lecturing can look like this to our students. Especially in this day and age with technology. Medical students, retention from lectures looks like this after 15 minutes. This is why you do not want to lecture more than 15 minutes in a row. If you introduce some kind of active learning, any kind, like a two minute buzz like we did, or two minutes exchange notes with your neighbor and look at each other's notes and talk, anything, you can try to cre recreate those humps again. It will never be as high as the first hump because people get tired and as they get tired they listen less well. But you can, if you insert a little active learning every 15 minutes, you can insert uh, a little bit of energy into the class. But instead, we go by the banker teacher model. <laughs> I know it, and you don't. So let me tell you about it, and you write it down. We equate teaching with lecturing. I remember the biggest insult I was ever given as a teacher was a colleague of mine said as I walked down the hall about me, she doesn't even teach. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm there every day. I wonder what she thinks I'm doing. <laughs> but what she meant was she doesn't even lecture. Despite 25 years of research, we still lecture 85% of class time, according to many reports. And you'll see there are a lot of citations there. There is one important HERI study that suggests the situation may be improving. According to this, only 55% of people in the 2009 study reported using extensive lecturing with the parenthetical remark, non-student-centered. 
Now, who in 2009 would want to remark that their teaching is non-student centered? So I think this, the way this question was asked is problematic. But at, at any rate, it suggested 55, not 85. But there are many studies that suggest 85. So you pay your money and you take your choice. This reminds me of the fable of the pitcher and the glass. In a land before time, in a school not far from this one, there was a pitcher that was trying to teach a glass. It wanted to teach everything in its pitcher, so it poured in a great rush. What is the moral of the story for learning? There, there are many morals. Shout out your morals. Too much information makes a mess, and you said there's teaching, no learning, they're different. You can't pour it into their heads. All right. You, you, this you are, is, whoops. You are assuming that students are empty vessels. You are assuming that students are empty vessels. Thank you. My moral is it's not what's poured from the pitcher, but what lands in the glass. We can pour all we want all day long, but what matters is what lands in the glass. Mix it up, try something a little differently. I'm going to recommend a couple of things right now and others as we go through the class. The pause procedure and interactive classroom exercises of any kind. The pause procedure, you pause two minutes three times in a 50 minute period, more in a 75 minute period. <coughs> Students rework notes in pairs with no interaction from the teacher. You can drink coffee, you can wander around. And it, this requires no preparation, by the way, that's why I'm highlighting it here. Because <laughs> so many of the wonderful interactive things we can do require hours of thinking and work. Uh, they're no quicker to do than lecture, a good lecture. Um, and ex experimentals did better than controls by 17% just by being given time to rest. And you're like, but they're not all on task. That's true. They aren't. Some are talking about football. Guess what? During your lecture with those, that little map we saw after 15 minutes, were they all on task? No, that's why they remember so little. Interactive classroom exercises of almost any kind. This is a study by Richard Hake with a 6,000 in. He, taught, he, he studied people who taught teaching traditionally with, uh, I'll, I'll define interactive at first. This is with immediate feedback through discussion with peers or instructors, anything brings about that counted as interactive. And the traditional approaches were mostly passive lectures, recipe labs, and algorithmic problem exams. The learning gain was different for the two styles. Many of you probably know Hake. Anybody want to give me the general summary of this? Who learned more? Interactive. They learned that much. Traditional learned half as much. It is almost true, I've heard Craig Nelson give detailed analysis of this study. It is almost true that the worst person with interactive outdid the best lecturer. I think there were a couple of examples out, that fell outside that in his 6,000 in, but in general, the worst interactive, you know, the beginner, you say, well, I can't start that now because I'll be so bad at it. Well, when you do start it, you'll be better than you were lecturing. Step four, let your readings share the lectern. The best lecture may be a carefully chosen reason, or excuse me, reading that's given to your students with a reason to read. Reading has advantages over listening. It's less passive. It's easier to stop and review and it frees class time for other activities that can't is easily be done at home unless you make use of the wonderful world of the web where students are participating in 
online discussions and so on at home. But it's harder to have interactive activities at home than it is in the classroom. It extends time on task, which is the biggest determinant of student learning. One of them. Reading should be carefully chosen for your students, I say, unless what you're trying to teach is better reading. There would be examples where you're trying to teach people to read very difficult texts, and that's the point. When it's not the point, I would choose readings carefully for my students. I would choose a level of detail that is appropriate for them, a reading level that is appropriate for them, and a, an appropriate amount of momentum. Now, I once shared my, um, I was picking a textbook for labor economics, and I shared seven textbooks with my student who was a senior student, it was a junior course, she'd had the course, and I said, you look at these textbooks and you order them one to seven. She was working for me. And um, I ordered them seven to one. We ordered them opposite. And I said, how did you pick your ordering? And she told me it had to have momentum, it had to catch my interest, it had to this and that. And I said, oh, I chose the one that taught me the most. And she said, that might be the problem because you have a PhD in this. <laughs> and I realized that what I was looking for in a text and what many faculty look for in a text is almost opposite what we need in a text if what we're teaching is not necessarily how to read hard text. What do you look for in your readings and how closely do these mirror what your students want and need? Have you asked your students to help you select books? Now, I wouldn't do it the way I did it where I just threw her seven books. I would probably give a chapter out of two books that I was considering and ask which of these two chapters to a class where they're not being paid to do it. Uh, which of these two chapters better meets your needs? But in general, the ones that make the biggest points big instead of the ones I was looking for where they had the most detail. Students need a reason to read. It's not enough to hand students reading and say, chapter seven, do next time. It may have been at one time, I don't know, that's how my teachers gave me reading, but it's not enough now. They need a focus. They need to know what they are reading for. And to meet this need, I give study questions every day. Study questions that show in this reading, these are the 10 things you need to know. And in my class, you'll be held accountable by a short quiz at the top of the hour over one of them. So think about a reason to read for your students. There's an expression, let your fingers do the walking. My expression is, let your readings do some of the talking. So we're going to buzz for one more minute with the same person you buzzed one minute each with the same person you buzzed with earlier and ask yourself what step might you take. It could be anything you thought of while you were listening to me. It doesn't have to be something I said. What step could you take to better teach content? So take a moment and buzz. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. If you can hear me, clap three times. All right. Our next set of steps is about students. And we'll start with step five, increase students' time on task. Full-time study, in theory, is 13 class hours plus 26 study hours, which comes to 39 total hours. I once had an argument with someone in the sciences, a dean actually, who said it should be three out of class hours. I think that's graduate school. But at any rate, where you're taking fewer hours. The reality is we study, we're in class 13 hours, we study 12, and that comes to 25. And we want to change this reality. At ODU, students, uh, Marsha got me this information, at ODU, students study about 10 hours, which is significantly less than other students in the NSSE at the .001 level. So it's a problem here, it's a problem where I teach, same results. 
It's a problem everywhere. In hours total. Out of class, anything com compared to class. And this is by self-report. And I don't know if you know it, but in many studies of self-report, we overestimate work, faculty included, by a factor of two. So it's at least this bad. This is self-report data. Survey students as to how many minutes, not hours, they study in your class. And I recommend that you do this before you lecture them on what it should be. Because you're not trying to get them to parrot back what you said it should be. You're trying to find out how much they're actually studying. Except in engineering at my school, where people seem to study very solid amounts. Um, most of these come back 15 to 20 minutes a day. Not an hour a day, like that survey said. 15 to 20 minutes a day. In, in the engineering field, they come back an hour or an hour and a half a day. So they beat the national average in engineering. I tell myself that the biggest determinant of time on task is the frequency of accountability. However often you hold them accountable, that's how often they tend to study. So lecture course punctuated by three tests is the worst way to teach because then they study three times. Daily testing improves final exam scores by 7%. That may not sound like much, but that's almost a letter grade for most of your class. It improves final exam scores 7%. By students self-report when asked how they feel about it, they say they do more frequent studying, more total studying, the two are related, and more learning. And they actually like the procedure. I quiz every day and have for 20 years. And students much prefer it to the pop quiz. Because they know I'm supposed to be ready. And I'll be rewarded if I am. And I am going to use this information tomorrow on a quiz. In contrast, if you do pop quizzes, they always feel like you're tricking them. You know, you knew they were up all night on another project. And there's a big groan in the class. And there's a lot of hostility around pop quizzes. There's no hostility around daily quizzes. The testing effect changes what you know. The testing effect says that when you take a test, it changes what you know. It's not just checking what you know. It's changing what you know. It's not like asking students to pull a book off a shelf. It's more like asking them to write part of a book on a shelf. How can you do this? I mentioned the quiz. Clickers or colored cards is another wonderful way. And neither of them requires grading, by the way, which is an advantage of these approaches. Clickers are great because you can, uh, you can grade if you want to without doing the grading. Colored cards are great because they require no technology. So you never have technological glitches. You just give people a stack of cards that have true, false, A, B, C, D on them. And when you're looking for a sea of blue, but you get a rainbow color, you know you've got a problem. If you're looking for a sea of blue, but you get all red, you've got a problem. And so it's easy enough to do. It's important when you use colored cards to have students hold them near their chest and to raise them at the same time. If you don't do those things, you'll wish you had clickers. Another way to hold students accountable daily is to use the jigsaw method of teaching. And its motto is the best way to learn is to teach. And if you have four components, suppose you had 16 students. And four components, the math gets a little challenging with this. So if you have a different number of students, it's harder. But let's, let's say we had the ideal number, 16. And you wanted to cover four topics that day. Instead of you lecturing on them, you start them in their home groups, this table right here. And you say, you're going to study Thailand. And then you say, you're going to study Singapore. And you're going to study Bangladesh. And you're going to study Malaysia. And then. You send them to, that's their home groups, where they learn, their expert groups. 
And then you send them to, I said this backwards, if that's the expert groups, then the home groups, they would go back to where they came from. But then you send them back to a group where there's one Thai, one Malaysia, one Bangladesh, and so on and so forth, one Singapore. And then their responsibility is to teach the material, and preferably you have a little quiz on it at the end. So that they're really accountable. It's my job to teach, and I'm responsible for what people get out of my teaching. It's explained in much more detail at jigsaw.org. But it's another good way to hold students accountable. Step seven, learn to love them. Here are a couple of quotes I'd like you to read about students. Would you care to guess when these were written and by whom? Yesterday. <laughs> Pardon? Your parents thought of this. Many years ago. And, and by what kind of people? Pardon? Greek. <laughs> Greek. The first one was written in Harvard in 1920. Now, that was a hard teaching gig. Can you imagine the elite students you were dealing with in Harvard in 1920? And the second. So, I don't know if you've ever said it, but sometimes I say, these students aren't like me. I try to counter that little voice that says the students aren't like me with another little voice that says they are not less motivated, because I don't mean it kindly when I say it, by the way. They're not less motivated, they're just motivated differently. I remind myself that Socrates complained about Plato. No kidding. Talk about the ideal teaching situation. <laughs> He still complained. My father was a teacher for 40 years in one school and some other years in other schools. And at his retirement, he said people, and that includes students, are motivated by three things, fear, duty, and love. As a professor for more than 40 years, I've tried all three in every combination. <laughs> and the greatest of these is love. I asked my, my dad a question about the time that he retired. I asked him how many students he had taught in his career. I count the students that I teach in workshops, so I thought, well, maybe he counts the, teachers, the students he teaches in his class. Actually, he hadn't. But I learned a lot from his answer anyway. He taught for 40 years at one school. Summer sabbaticals and free time, he taught at other schools. He taught between 8 and 14 classes per year with student enrollment that averaged between 12 and 39. The way he learned this was he went through his old grade books to answer my question. <laughs> Remember those old green ones before we had any self spreadsheets? He taught 5,919 students. 5,919 students. You might wonder why I'm telling you this. It was accompanied by one table, three graphs, and a nine-page single-space description. What was the point? He counted his students because every student counts. And we have to figure out how to make students count. And I'll, I'll give a few of my favorite ideas for making students count next. First of all, you have to get to know your students. And this um, little clip is a student's way of trying to help us get to know them in the modern age.
Yeah, it's good. Probably. student counts. One thing I do is students come into my office and they always say the same thing. Am I interrupting you? And I have taken to saying, you're not an interruption, you're the reason I'm here. And that seems to take them aback a bit, but it, it puts in perspective that my office hours in particular are for them. They're not an interruption. I'm, I'm hoping they'll come. Advise a student group. I got the most imaginable insight into students that I've ever had by advising a student group and working with them late at night in my home and so on and so forth. Come to class early and stay late. Learn and use names. So what did they say? What percent knew their name? 18. Oh, I hope it's not that way here. I doubt it is. Take role every day. It makes a statistically significant difference in learning, believe it or not. So if you don't want to take role, hold them accountable every day, and that will be your role. Look into their eyes. Many public speakers say the single most important thing we can do is look into students' eyes or speak audience eyes for one sentence. Of course, if they look down, look away. But if you can stay for one sentence with people, even the people behind them think you're looking right at them. There's a little cone. So if I look at you in the green, many of the people behind you in that cone will think I'm looking right at them. And it makes a connection. It makes our, instead of, you know, something impersonal, it makes class more personal. Do a class schedule and stick with it. I know it's not always possible, but when I was new, I would change mine compulsively, and it drove students batty. Turn back papers within a week, and be the teacher you want them to think you are. Turn to the neighbor and buzz for one minute each, two minutes total, and the question is, what steps might you take to better teach? students. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. All right. Let's come back together. And the last set of steps I have are about you. I get in the way of my own good teaching more often than I can count. If you've never seen the ways you get in the way of your own teaching, start looking for them because I think we all have ways that we get in trouble. Step eight, take responsibility for your class. I'm in a job like Dr. Abdus, and when I find teachers that are going to be in the most trouble of any teachers on campus, they're the, student, they're the teachers who blame the students. They're the teachers who say in a workshop, remember the glass and the water? They're, they're the ones who say in the workshop, give us bigger glasses. Because of course we're paid to teach the glasses we get. We're not paid to teach only the most privileged and um, well-prepared students. So if there's one thing you can do if you're not doing it, if you have a tendency to blame students, it's to take responsibility for your class. Learning is a two-way street to be sure, and it's always good to ask students to reflect on their part. But you can't change them except by changing your own behavior. It's a lot like therapy, you know. I say, he doesn't do the dishes. And they say, so what are you going to do differently? And I say, well, I'm not going to do anything differently. It's him that doesn't do the dishes. And they say, so what are you going to do differently? And so on and so forth until I have the inspiration. 
that I need to do something differently if his behavior is going to change. Tell yourself that the buck stops here. If class isn't going the way you want it to, you're the leader, you're the one who has to make a difference. You say, well, how do you work smarter without working harder? Because most of us are at capacity now. And the way to work harder, smarter without working harder is to sharpen the saw, which is what you're doing this morning. You're giving yourself a space to think of ideas in which you could go back and be more effective in your job. But it's hard to do that because it's important, but it's not urgent. There's no deadline to do it. So invite yourself to do it more often. Because when you do that, you create a space for which you can, from which you can really improve. Stephen Covey said we should spend about 10% of our time sharpening the saw. Abe Lincoln was a little harsher. He said if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend four sharpening my axe. Step nine, write your ideas for improving class each day. This is a little bit of faculty development that you can do at home. I like to write on my, um, I like to write on my notes from class what I'm going to do differently next year each day. And then when I get to the end of the year, I type them up. And that greatly informs, because I didn't always do this, and what would happen is I would be teaching a certain subject and I'd be having a problem and I'd be like, I had this problem last year. It's the same problem. That's because I was teaching with the same technique and the same problem. So I write down the problem and then I figure out how to adjust the technique, trying to get it to work a little better. How many of you write down your ideas for improving class? Good, good. I see some hands. Excellent. A lot of hands over here. Good. Step 10, give midterm evaluations. How many of you give midterm evaluations? By show of hands, not too many. Okay. I like to give them three and seven weeks into the semester if I'm having any trouble at all. If it's rocking, I might wait until seven weeks into the semester. I once gave them every two weeks and I remember telling my students after 10 weeks or so, I know you're tired of these and I'm not going to give them any more because we've, we've learned a lot and thank you, but we're not going to give them any more. No, they said, we like student evaluations. They wanted to give them every two weeks right to the end of the course. And we were learning a lot from them and adjusting things as we went, but we'd gotten in kind of a groove and we thought we could maybe uh, escape giving them the last few weeks, but they said no. Students will like student evaluations if they see you using them. I like to do it in a write pair share format. I like to have students write alone for five minutes, maybe. For the faint of heart, stop right there, collect them. And if you're even fainter, have people read them to you, summarize them for you. So instead of saying something like, when people bring them to the center for me to summarize for them, I say, um, instead of saying, this person is an idiot, he doesn't know anything, I say, the students are not convinced of your complete command of the material. <laughs> For the brave, proceed with the right pair share and have people work in pairs and come out with one, one suggestion for you. The beauty of this is they see that a lot of their concerns cancel out. Someone thinks you lecture too much, someone thinks you lecture too little. They, they work that out in their group, they see how hard your job is. And then they come up with one thing they can agree on. But they ask three questions. What most helps you learn in this class? Definitely not what do you most like about this class, but what most helps you learn, what most interferes with your learning, and what could you, as a student, do to learn more? And at the bottom they ask how many minutes they study per class day. When you get these, and when you're listening to them go over these evaluations in class, you want to listen the way an owl eats a mouse. 
He trusts his organism to make use of what's good and get rid of what isn't. And that's how you want to listen. So when you're listening, you avoid words like no or but or I tried that last semester. You avoid things like that. And you say things like say more about that. Tell me what makes you think that. What would class be like if I tried that? Things that encourage them. And I just listen on this day, the day that I give the evaluations. I don't make comments about my teaching. Then I come back the next class period ready to make some comments. I announce my changes and I post them on the board. These are the three things I'll be changing based on the evaluations you gave me. Look for changes coming at a classroom near you. I stick with those like glue. They're like a promise I've made that these evaluations could actually help them in real time in this semester rather than helping the next group in next semester. I clarify anything I'm confused about. Someone said blah, 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 and I'm not sure what it meant. Does anybody have an idea what it might have meant? And usually someone will speak up, sometimes even the person who wrote it. And then I explain why some things are not negotiable. I usually get, I mentioned um, daily quizzes are popular. I usually get about a three to one ratio of daily quizzes are good versus daily quizzes stink. And the daily quizzes are good things, I tell the students, say things like I learn more, I study more, I work harder. And the things that are, uh, that say it's bad, say it gets in my way, it's a nuisance, I hate it. And this is an easy choice for me. So we'll be sticking with the daily quizzes. And I, I had a teacher recently who came with uh, the opposite ratio of daily quiz. Um, three said they didn't like it for every one that said they did. So that can happen, I learned this semester. And what she did was she showed them, she made a graph of their midterm. Uh, they had had two midterms at the time they were taking this. And their midterm grades on exams were much higher than the semester before. So she still said it's non-negotiable, even though in her class it was unpopular. And then I invite their changes. I, I may even put on the board, I may put a lot of things on the board, but I'm, one of them may be the number of comments in the high range. So like seven of you said I need to read more, five said I need to participate in class more, three said that sort of thing. And I, I just invite them to ponder those things that they might actually control and be able to make a difference on. This is shown in a, in a um, video at Team Based Learning Org. It's a TBL video about team based learning, but there's one assessing courses and team effectiveness at midterm that shows you how to effectively, um, how to effectively give evals and respond in a non-threatening way. Teambasedlearning.org. I can't promise this approach will change your evaluations from a 312 to a 10, 10, 10, but I can tell you it's done a lot for mine because students see how hard you're trying. So it raises my evaluations because people say, wow, if she tries that hard, maybe I should try hard too. <coughs> Become a student of teaching is step 11. Read, read everything you can get your hands on. Start with um, Parker Palmer's The Courage to Teach. It's wonderful about creating a space between you and your students to put the subject at the middle. It's neither teaching-centered nor student-centered, he says, but subject-centered. Try Ken Bain's What the Best Teachers Do, another great one. So read just like you read. Study teaching the way you studied other subjects. Get yourself to class. And by that I mean peers' classes. Go to them. See who won the top award on your campus each year. And go visit that class. 
It's a valuable way. I saw so many things. When I first came to New Mexico State, I went to about 10 teachers who had won the top award. I went to their class and I watched and I listened. And I saw what was different between their class and mine and what I could adopt and not adopt. I saw both, but I, especially the things I could adopt were very, very useful. Go to the Center for Learning and Teaching. They have a couple of things that, as you're doing now, they have a couple of things that are really great. They have the Connect with Colleagues Lecture Series and the Provost Conversation on Teaching and Learning. And I believe it's the Connect with Colleagues Lecture Series that uh, lets, features one teacher who talks for 20 minutes about a technique that works for them. Am I right? And then I've got this from your website. And then lets, opens it for discussion to the rest of the room. Very useful. Dr. Abdus, would you like to say anything else about what's available at the Center for Learning and Teaching? Yes, actually, I would be talking about that in my presentation. Oh, good. But yes, go to those talk to reviews if you have your time. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Step 12 Write your own steps for success. Every teacher is different and the subjects we teach differ. To paraphrase Alan Watts on God, he said, I'll say success is like a mountaintop. The way the tops are many and varied, some are better for some and some are better for others. It's not like you can adopt someone else's style. As Parker Palmer says, everything depends on the identity and the integrity of the teacher. So your own identity is like a fingerprint. It, you have to teach in your own personal style. Any well-described, frequently adjusted path is better than no path at all. Stop being unconscious as a teacher and start writing your own steps and ultimately your own teaching philosophy. So we'll take two minutes to turn to a neighbor and buzz about what steps might you take to be a better teacher yourself. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. All right, I did these um, two minute buzzes in um, a particular way today, and I did them on purpose. And one is to show you what a two-minute buzz can accomplish. Just two minutes, I timed them. And so if you are lecturing wall-to-wall, -wall, and you could take two minutes for a buzz or for a note comparison, which is what they recommended in the article that found you can increase your learning 17% with the pause procedure, they just said, turn to your neighbor and compare notes. That was the only instructions they gave. This alerted students that they should be taking notes. <laughs> so you could either do a buzz, or you could do a two minute compare notes, or you could alternate. But you can get a lot done in two minutes with willing participants. Now, you were so willing, I could have given you five productively, probably. But I gave you two just to show what puncturing a lecture with two minutes can do. OK, I would like to hear from people who are taking something away today, something that you would do differently, teaching your students, yourself, or your content. So what things would you do that I didn't say? I'm the most interested in things that I did not say, but that came to you or that you do in your own practice. Not all at once. You must have been writing something down in these two-minute periods or thinking some thought. Well, I just want to, um, I love the two-minute buzz and also the pairing and, oh, thanks. Ooh, sorry. And sharing and, you know, distilling down to one idea from multiple ideas, for instance, of the class. And I just wanted to toss out something that I've used for almost 20 years that I got from Vince Tinto when he was here about 20 years ago. Uh, he's, I think, a nuclear physicist at R RPI. And, and in teaching um, you know, entry-level physics, 
he tossed out that he does a two-minute essay. He calls it a two-minute essay at the end of every class period. And I have found this incredibly effective. Um, and it's the way I take role. And I say at the end of class, spit out in two minutes on paper, either anonymously or not. Uh, you can only take role if it's not anonymous. Um, anything you've learned, gained, understood better, have clearer as a result of today's class period. And then also, uh, you know, write out on paper anything that you're confused, puzzled, anxious, question. And in two minutes, I collect these. And then it's a great thread for the beginning of the next class period. It's a daily pulse. So, and, but again, in two minutes, it's remarkable what you can really get. It's so. wonderful. There, there are variations on that. You often hear it called the one minute paper. And it makes a statistically significant difference in learning to use it every day at the end of class. So that's wonderful. And you can ask questions like, what's the muddiest point? What was least clear to you if you've given a difficult lecture? You can ask, what was the main point? You'll be amazed at the variety of answers you get. Because um, you, you, we often don't communicate the main point, And that helps us learn how to communicate what the main point is. I teach online, I no longer use it. How can you do that effectively in a distance format? Because I always used it, I was taught it. I'd like to hear audience responses, but what I do is not quite that, but I have students write on the discussion board. I have students write on the discussion board um, something that you can have them write on the discussion board, a question they had and the answer they would give to it, or the main point, or something muddy once, once a day for me. I have them do it every day on the discussion board before they come to the discussion because it, it primes the pump. Then we have things to talk about. What did you think about what Mary said yesterday in the discussion board? And to review, here's what she said. What, what's your reaction to that? So it primes the pump for discussion, so I use it every day. Do other people have online suggestions for her? Do you have an online suggestion? No, this no? is different. Anybody? Did you want to say one more thing before we pass it? All right, go ahead. What I do with my students, I put them in groups if I feel it's a difficult problem for any student. But I put the stronger ones with the weaker ones, and then we have discussion after a quick break. Great. Stronger with weaker. So you don't let it be random where the people with the same social circle will be sitting together. Very well. You. Other things you try or that work for you? Yes, we've got one back here. Sometimes I do activities. I teach medical terminology and rules I gain with the words. But when I put them in groups, I have opportunities. I have students who are stronger and who are weaker. And the weaker students will not always participate. Um, should I maybe do more groups? What should I do to get the weaker ones to participate? It's a difficult question. Um, I find that groups are dominated by stronger students. You can mix your groups so that you don't always have, I'm not saying for the whole term, but you don't always have stronger students in your groups. That puts pressure on weaker students to participate because that's who's in the group. I wouldn't do it for the whole semester, however, like team-based learning, but for a short time. Are there other responses to how you get weaker students to participate in groups? The other thing I do is make them very small. I like groups of three. Groups of two are even harder to hide in. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share? OK, we'll proceed. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the Center for Learning and Teaching, and particularly Dr. Abdus for bringing me in. Thank you so much. I should also give a big shout out to Dr. Joy Fisher Sykes. She was wonderful. She helped me so much. Joy, thank you. I'm going to let you work on your evaluations for two minutes, surprise, surprise. And um, you can work on them as we're closing out as well. 
Then I will close out this workshop after you do two minutes on your evaluation. This is just a pause. It's terribly important to focus on those steps that you will take like a laser beam. Stephen Covey tells us to know it and not to do it is not to know it. And that is so true. To know it and not to do it is not to know it. The most important step you will ever take is writing your steps, writing your teaching philosophy, getting clear on what you do to be excellent. And every time you fall off the writing wagon, climb right back on and try your steps again. I hope you don't think teaching is a hard way to earn your stripes, but if you ever do, which I often do, I want you to know you've got Dr. Abduz to come to, to call, to email, to visit, who can help you with those kinds of things. At my first school, where I wanted to be tenured and remain for my career, at my first school, there was actually a graveyard for teachers. I was in determined, it was an old, rich private school, and they had graveyards for teachers at those days. I was determined to be buried in that graveyard. I went so far as to write what would be on my gravestone. <laughs> Here lies Tara Gray, a teacher to the last. She died trying. What do you want your teaching gravestone to say? And most importantly, what do you want students to say when they visit it? Be all you can be, teach. Thank you very much. <laughs>